Laurie, what you say is so positive, uh, it's hard to believe. As far as, I'm, it's hard to believe for me. I guess I wasn't aware exactly what you were doing. <laughs> but uh, keep on doing it. All right. Is there ever an occasion uh, in, your, in your lobbying to, uh, that you mention uh, Minnesota atheists? To um, it, yeah, when we walk into the Minnesota delegation. So certainly uh, we were able, when, when we talked to uh, Senator Klobuchar and, and Senator Coleman's uh, office and also um, Ellison, uh, Representatives Ellison and McCollum, we, we certainly, especially since we had members, or, or actually you know, a, a board, board member uh, to, you know, from Minnesota Atheists to introduce themselves that way and explain who, who you are. Um, for other offices, to tell you the truth, it wouldn't really make a difference. But, but certainly, um, we like when we walk into an office to say, and here are the groups of non-theists in your constituency. And, and there's always some, but yours is one of the much more active ones. So you know, when, when August can say, oh, this is how many active members we have, it's very impressive. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question was the status of the FFRF case. Um, it's called Hine versus FFRF, and by the way, I'm sure they'll keep updates on FFRF's website, which is ffrf.org. Um, it was heard in oral arguments a couple of weeks ago, just the question of whether or not they're allowed to bring the case as taxpayers. So. It usually takes a couple of months after the oral arguments before they decide. And when they decide, they're going to be deciding, does the fact that you're a taxpayer give you status to bring an Establishment Clause case? And this is based on a 1969 US Supreme Court case called Flast versus Cohen that first gave taxpayers that right. Um, and by the way, this had to do with the Head Start discrimination. Uh, Representative Andrews from uh, New Jersey was talking about who are taxpayers in the context of Head Start, who pays for it. And it was really nice in that committee hearing to hear his list of all the different people who are taxpayers, because in his list were Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, and there was a little more to the list. And how nice that we are included and recognize that we pay taxes also. But the Supreme Court, I digress, which I do sometimes, but the Supreme Court in a couple of months should be making this decision. We expect they might limit that Flast v. Cohen decision to some extent. Some of the, the specific ways they could limit it are saying, well, this is uh, an executive branch uh, area because it's the President's Office of Faith-Based Initiative, and we're only going to let taxpayers bring these cases if it deals with Congress. Or they could say, we're not going to let taxpayers bring any of these cases. Or they could say, um, we're looking at how much actual taxpayer money goes to these conferences. So there's a lot of different ways they could look at the fact pattern and make decisions how broad or, or narrow they decide to allow taxpayers to bring these cases. Given the makeup of the Supreme Court, uh, well, I, I talked to a couple of lawyers who were coming, because we, we stayed outside to do a rally and explain to people that, you know, this is this office of faith-based initiatives are not treating everyone equally like they did before 2000. Because a lot of people are out there telling the public that before 2000, religious groups couldn't get federal grants, which is wrong. I mean, they were getting federal grants constantly. They were just treated equally, and, and they had to follow the same rules. So we were trying to educate the public about this whole process because there's so much false rhetoric out there. And what happens is um, when the lawyers came out of oral arguments, you know, we asked them how to go, how to go, because there were a lot of, of, of lawyers on both sides, because there were a lot of um, amicus, friend of the courts, from different groups in addition to FFRF. And the, the best information we could get was they didn't feel real good about this particular case, but if they lost this case, they were hoping it, the decision would be narrow enough that it was only because it was the executive branch and because they didn't find enough money going that way, and not just say no taxpayer can ever bring an Establishment Clause case, which of course would make the Establishment Clause case virtually unenforceable. And so you'd have a piece of the Bill of Rights of the Constitution that no one could really enforce. 
and everyone could just ignore and pretend it doesn't exist. So, yeah. I wanted to understand a little better about Pete Stark. Did, did he uh, come out and indicate his position because the like Coalition of America's survey, or was that the initiative? He probably wouldn't right. so well if it hadn't been for that. And, and what exactly took place that brought that about? And what exactly did he uh, say, or indicate that he said he was an atheist? Mm -hmm. or, no. Or we held a contest uh, beginning in October of last year. One of our advisory board members, uh, Dave Niosi, had this great idea after being very disturbed, like many of us were, to see these surveys that were saying that people will not vote for us, no matter what are our positions on the policies, no matter what our voting record, just because we don't have a God belief. And so he said, well, you know, what if we asked people to nominate, who do you think is the highest level elected official? And then ask those people nominated, you know, is that you and are you willing to say that publicly? Um, you know, what would the results be? You know, would there be someone, I mean, Ron Reagan Jr. once said he wouldn't run for office because uh, he doesn't believe in God and, and so therefore he doesn't think he could win any seat higher than dog catcher. So the question was, was there any elected official higher than dog catcher who shared our beliefs in naturalistic, you know, ethics and such? And so between October and the deadline for the contest, which was December 31st, we received 47 uh, nominations. And then we sent the, the, the page to check off one of the three options to the people that were nominated. And we also had a cover letter explaining the contest and you know, why we were doing this. And um, then we also followed up with phone calls from people we didn't get the forms back from. And even with the follow-ups, we still, more than half of the people we sent the forms to, didn't return them at all. Now, let me explain why that's especially concerning. We didn't just give them two options. We didn't have just a box. Well, we had a box that said, I am non-theistic, and there was an asterisk, and explained non-theistic includes atheists, humanists, agnostics, free thinkers, and others who don't have a belief in a supreme being or beings. It said, I'm a non-theist, asterisk, and I identify as, and then there was a blank, I also give permission to the SCA to release this information to the general public. The second option was, no, I, I'm not a non-theist. The third option was, I prefer not to discuss this in a political context. Okay? And, and we, when we talked to people, either by phone or a few people in person, we explained, you know, no hard feelings if you want to choose the third option. And in fact, I remember talking to Stark's staff and saying, you know, because they were like, well, we're pretty sure it's the first one. It's like, well, first have him think about this, you know, because he, this is not a, an easy thing to do politically. And, um, you know, so, you know, there is that third option. <laughs> so we didn't want anyone to do anything real fast and then be upset about it. Well, three, three individuals nominated themselves, the president of the Berkeley School Board, a member of a school board in Maine, and a member of a town council in Massachusetts. So they, all be, obviously, since they nominated themselves, checked the first box, and so did Representative Stark. And then when interviewed um, by his local Fremont newspaper, um, said, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the big deal is. I, you know, I was asked about my beliefs. I checked off, uh, you know, the, the first box because <clears throat> I'm a un Unitarian who doesn't have a belief in a supreme being, and uh, and and it was like no one's ever asked me before, but it's not something you know that he's ever hidden. Uh, so, you know, it's it's interesting. There are certain parts of the country where, and and also, you know, Representative Stark has been in office for over 30 years. So his constituents know that he is, obviously they feel he's representing them quite well because they keep reelecting him by overwhelming margins. Well, when people were interviewed about this, like one of the um, state senators said, well, I'm not going to vote for him now because he doesn't believe what I believe. But, <laughs> but another uh, pastor from uh, one of the evangelical churches, I think it was, said, that wouldn't matter to me. I'd still vote for him. So, you know, I mean, most people are going to look at someone and say, well, do they represent me well? Not, what do they believe deep down in their hearts? And, uh, but there are parts of the country where that's not the case. I mean, lots of parts of the country, and, and those surveys we were talking about were national. So the majority of Americans aren't going to just vote for who they think are going to 
follow their positions, they're going to vote for who believes what they believe, you know, about whether there's a supreme being or not. Yeah. You um, ran for public office successfully. Did it ever come up in your campaign? It never came up in my campaign <laughs> in, um, in the Las Vegas and Henderson area of uh, Nevada. And that's, that's really um, fortuitous for me because uh, this was in 1992 when I ran. Uh, I was, I had no money and I was running against someone who had a lot of money and I won anyway, which surprised everybody because I was the grassroots person. I got a lot done in my time there and then we did a poll that showed I would be reelected overwhelmingly. Now, I wasn't reelected. And here's the ironic thing. I was attacked for being a Jew. <laughs> I was the only Jew in the Nevada State Senate. No one asked me if I believed in God. I mean, I don't think anyone even knows, knew what a humanistic Jew was back then. <laughs> but um, but they, they used the fact that I was the only Jew in the Senate to start doing Christian prayers and make a, an issue of the fact, at, towards the end, I mean, of that, I didn't, that even though, even as an atheist, I was able to enjoy the non-sectarian prayers because I had learned years ago how to humanistically interpret, you know, whatever they're saying to, to what really, you know, makes me love what I'm doing, you know, and I felt very patriotic about what I was doing. But when they started changing to Christian prayers every day, it was the Jew in me who just couldn't participate anymore in that. So, so they made an issue of that and then made some lie about my patriotism that everyone believed because they, you know, there was that thing, especially out West, where if you're a Jew, you can't be patriotic and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> And, and then, then my opponent also got three state senators to lie for her and say that I turned my back on the flag and the chambers and all this stuff that never happened. So, um, so I only served one term, but I, I loved serving in office. And I think had anyone specifically wanted to know if I believed in God, that would have torpedoed you know, my service. And that's sad. That's really sad because the people you know, until I started believing these other things about my patriotism, really liked what I had done. Um, by the way, there, there is an epilogue to this. The woman who defeated me had won her first elected office in a racist campaign against an African-American woman. And then she defeated me in an anti-Semitic campaign. And then she became state controller and got impeached for using state workers on government time for her reelection. And last year, this is sad, she was 50 years old. She was murdered by her fourth husband. So <laughs> it's, I'm not saying, I don't believe in karma, but, but, uh, but that's the epilogue. That's the epilogue to the story. So, and, and by the way, this is part of her campaign was that she was more moral than I was because she was a Christian. And she was on her fourth husband at that point, And I, I'm still on my first after 20 years. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. In your talks with Pete Stark, did he ever tell you that he has a huge peace sign on the top of his bank since at least June of 1970. In Berkeley. In Berkeley. Wow. No, I, I, have, I have to tell you honestly, I didn't actually talk face to face with Representative Stark, though I had been in his office before to talk to him about some issues. Um, I mean, to talk to his staff about some issues. I was working directly with his press person and his chief of staff, but they didn't tell me that either. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, what other parts of the country did some of your candidates come from? I mean, you, you oh. You mean the nominees? Right. Um, we are not giving out any information about the nominees, only the four who said yes. Because, you know, that, I think that's part of why people were afraid to even send it back, that we would have something in writing with their name showing that they'd even been nominated. And we were so careful. I mean, there were only like three of us in the organization who even knew who was being nominated. We were so careful to protect the names of anyone who didn't choose that first box that even generally we're not getting more specific. Um, and, and I got emails from people when we started this contest saying, why are you trying to out these people? And I was like, no, that's not what we're doing, you know, so, yeah. Could you elaborate on how um, your opponent uh, ran against you as not being patriotic as Jewish? <laughs> well, she claimed that I refused to say pledge allegiance to, to pledge allegiance to the flag. And I know, you know, it has that unconstitutional under God part in it, but I felt so pa like, like hyper-patriotic when I was one of 21 state senators voting every day on issues affecting everyone in my state. And even though I lived in an urban district, I was concerned about the needs of the rural communities. And every, I mean, I, was, I put in like 
15-hour work days because I, I, people had to drag me out of my office. I loved what I was doing. And so, you know, I stood there and said the Pledge of Allegiance, and I don't think anyone noticed. I'm sure no one noticed whether I said under God or not. Well, she claimed that I refused to pledge allegiance to the flag. But first she had to talk about how I wouldn't participate in traditional daily prayer, which I guess was her um, euphemism for the Christian ones. So, and, and the only reason they were able to win that way is my district was a lower class working district that had the most veterans of any district in the state. I had a 100% voting record for veterans and there was a Republican majority, I was a Democrat. I helped the Republican majority get a, a bill through, because it was a very close difference, it was 10 and 11. So in, on the transportation committee I was on, um, we were the, in the majority and I helped the Republicans pass a funding bill to get the special license plates for the veterans be home because they couldn't pass it without the Democrats and I, I pushed it through. After all that, they claimed that I was um, turning my back on veterans. Yeah. Anyway, that's, I got over that a long time ago. <laughs> I really did, honest. Yeah. Well, when Religious Freedom Restoration Act and also Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act were first passed, they were passed by a coalition of not only religious groups, but also Americans United for Separation of Church and State, ACLU. Most of our usual allies supported these bills. And they supported them because there were some pretty wacky decisions made about the First Amendment. Um, there was the, the Smith case that said you can't use a little bit of peyote in a Native American ritual. Um, there was another case, I think, about head coverings um, in prisons and even like Jews and Muslims couldn't wear head coverings because there was a rule that affected everyone about head coverings. Well, I understand that a rule saying no head coverings affects a Jew or a Muslim different than it affects me, so it doesn't matter that the rule applies equally to everybody. I mean, I understand that, but the Supreme Court uh, I think AU and ACLU felt they got it wrong. And so they passed this law saying, well, now you've got to use a whole different test. But, and then when, when RIFRA, when the part of that got overturned regarding states, so it wasn't just about federal stuff anymore, then they were looking at, well, what happens if a county says no church is allowed in our district because we want all the tax revenue we can possibly get and they don't pay taxes? Well, you know, that's discrimination generally against religion, so we better put this thing, you know, in the bill, say, in this new bill, saying religious land use, you pretty much, it, it leaves them thinking they can do whatever they want. And so they didn't anticipate the kind of abuses that have happened. One of my member groups, the American Humanist Association, originally supported these two bills. And later, when they saw the abuses, came out against them. Um, and so there's... Um, there's a need to at least tweak these bills to stop this flood of, of um, attacks on you know, legitimate land use regulations. But we don't have our usual allies with us on it. And people in Congress are concerned that if they vote to, to weaken a religious freedom bill that it will hurt them rhetorically. Yeah, Bruce. You know, recognize that there's a sort of an overwhelming Christian um, uh, identity in, in Washington, uh, our government, but is there any kind of a uh, flavor of Christianity or de facto religion that gets preferential treatment or deference? Well, in the, the, answer, the question was about, like, in, in Congress, is there, is there like a preferential kind of de facto Christian uh, privileging? Um, the Pentagon, you know, these, these generals they meet and they have these Bible study things and, and then they, they have this thing online saying we believe first that we have to defend our God, second our families, third our country. I mean that's scary stuff depending on what their God tells them to do with our country. Um, so it's, uh, yeah it, it happens. I mean you even have uh, well, one, of, one of the most religious Christians in Congress um, and, and by the way she votes right on virtually all church-state separation issues, so I don't want this to be a real negative. But one of the most religious members is Nancy Pelosi, who's now the majority leader of the House. And you know, she gets up on the floor last year and says, under God and the pledge, we all agree it's beautiful, and we all agree, and it's like, no, we don't all agree, Nancy, you know? I mean, well, Representative Pelosi. But, but uh, 
you know, so, so this kind of stuff happens a lot. And uh, in fact, when we announced who the highest level elected official we could find was this one Congress member, a group uh, run by James Lafferty, who's the son-in-law of Lou Sheldon. I don't know if you guys know of Lou Sheldon, but he runs this Christian Seniors Association. They sent out this press release saying, every member of Congress needs to get on the floor of, of the House and say, I believe in God. Well, first of all, they've been doing that for years. <laughs> But, but it, they kind of want it now to be this test. Do you or don't you? You know, we're going to not vote for you if you don't. And, you know, it's, it's re- it, it, it kind of proves our point. But, yeah, it exists. And, and like I said, Office of Faith-Based Initiatives, you know, this is federal money. Now you're not just talking about someone talking about their personal beliefs. You're talking about them not letting someone get a grant because they don't share their beliefs. Well, I'm wondering, is, <laughs> is there any particular religion, religion that tends to rise to the top of all this and gets most preference? Or is it just some kind of mishmash of... Well, I don't know. well, there, there was um, a, a, a survey of every member of Congress that showed a huge number of Congress members were Christian. Um, but uh, not, I, I mean, rhetorically, a lot, they'll, they'll try to you know, bring religion into every one of their arguments. I mean, stem cell research, um, uh, marriage. Well, I mean, some of the... the um, arguments when they were doing the marriage amendment, well, there was one that was more offensive to me than the religious ones, and that was when uh, Alabama Senator Sessions got up, and he actually said, we are not going to sit by again and watch the definition of marriage be changed. And I immediately emailed the people I was working on with this issue, and I, I was saying, was he, is he referring back to interracial marriage? And they're going, yep, he's still for segregation. So, I mean, at least he was acknowledging that this, you know, rhetoric that the definition of marriage has never been changed. Well, of course it's been changed, you know, uh, legally, you know. But, um, but, you know, they're not going to watch it be changed again like it was for interracial couples. So, but a lot of the rhetoric on that and on stem cell research is all about, well, this, well, very recently, look at the don't ask, don't tell policy. I mean, you have General Pace actually saying, well, I believe that their actions are immoral, therefore this law needs to stay on the books. Well, how do you say to the nation's military or the nation's citizens that my belief about what's moral or immoral is going to dictate our civil law? And they do it all the time. Um, it's really scary. I mean, he can say, yeah, I believe it's immoral, but that shouldn't have anything to do with someone else, you know? And, I mean, that's, that's his belief, you know? Yeah. Uh, recently, workplace, religion in the workplace is a big issue around here from yeah. party cashiers to cab drivers. And, uh, I noticed a while back there was uh, a bill, I don't know if it got out of committee called the, um, in the Senate, called the um, Workplace Religious Expression Act. Uh. It was Surprisingly, it was co-sponsored by Senators Clinton and Kerry. And I wanted Not to so surprising. Well, Sorry. Uh, well, Kerry's a little surprising. I, I Seeing Clinton on that isn't that surprising uh, to me. I wanted to comment on that because I think too often we just make assumptions about people's uh, positions on, on the First Amendment by their party. Or by oh, by you can't do that. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and in fact, uh, that James Lafferty guy from Christian Seniors Association, when I was on the Alan Combs show opposite him on radio, um, when he was asked, because he said, oh, there's atheists taking over Congress. And, and it was like, so, so Combs asked him, like, who? And he said, Nancy Pelosi. He was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, this is just, you say, well, anyone who, has, who I consider liberal has to be an atheist. Um, in any event, obviously, that's you know, silly. Um, well, according to James Lafferty, <laughs> obviously not. Um, so uh, in, in any event, in, in fact, by the way, um, we, have, we have a lot of uh, atheist supporters who, who tend to be more uh, libertarian and a few that are Republican, you know, obviously. But um, so th- these, these workplace expression things are, are such an, a nuanced area um, because, you know, I can see if someone has a job where they assign you to work certain days and, and you, you know, entered that job thinking, okay, you know, um, my employer knows up front that I never work on a Sunday because that's my Sabbath or I never work on a Saturday because that's my Sabbath and, 
and then um, you know they have the flexibility where they work their schedules around other people that if if an employer suddenly says well now you got to work Saturday or you're out you know that's you know that's pretty clear uh, usually um, or you have a printer one of the cases that came up years ago where there was one particular uh, flyer that was offensive to someone's religion that worked in the print shop but there were lots of other people who could do that job and there was lots of other work that he could do you know that that's pretty easy to accommodate is it easy or necessary to accommodate people who won't touch certain groceries if they take a job scanning groceries you know I mean that that's a pretty far stretch you know you're taking a job to scan groceries you can assume there are going to be pork products coming through you know um, uh, it's it gets a little more crazy and I think something like workplace expression act might be designed to handle the kinds of cases where someone is being told uh, you can't walk into this office with a head covering just to keep Muslims and, and Orthodox Jews from getting those jobs where it has nothing to do with the job but those kinds of things could be handled through the courts I mean you know it, what happens is they may have a bill that attempts to deal with those kind of instances and instead encompasses a tremendous amount of abuse like what happened with Rifra and Ralupa and have all these unintended consequences where you know now grocery stores don't know you know who to hire because suddenly they won't touch part of the groceries you know that's that's a little bit different or, or a pharmacist is going to decide who gets what prescriptions based on their own you know theologies then you know don't work as a pharmacist you know or work as a pharmacist in a Catholic hospital that doesn't dispense birth control you know or something like that you know find a job that suits your beliefs yeah, yeah. Some, some sentiment behind that was for employers who want to have religious types of services in the workplace to you know, kind of allow them or give them the freedom to do that but that seems like the worst well, environment well the thing is they already have the right to do that they're, if they're not a government entity, are you talking about governmental entities or private employers? Well, it's a huge difference. Yeah. 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 Um, if they're a private employer, they have the right to do that as long as they don't make um, a, um, there's a legal term that I'm blanking on, um, uh, it's a harassing atmosphere, it's, it's um, hostile, work hostile work environment, thank you. I can't believe I was blanking on that because I use that term a lot. As long as they're not making a hostile work environment for people who don't attend those meetings and that you know, they're not during work time, they're, you know, uh, well you can even do it in public schools after school, before school, you know, as long as it's not during school time. Um, so I think a lot of those kinds of bills are put there to make people think these things don't already exist and that we need to fight to you know, have these things happen. Um, in, in fact, I, I think um, the stem cell alternative in, in today's newspaper, or no, it wasn't today's newspaper, I'm sorry, it was, it was in Roll Call, which is a political um, insider thing. Uh, Coleman was, was um, saying that his alternative bill will be a nice alternative because it'll allow this research. Well, the research he's talking about is already allowed. So, you know, it's, it's just rhetorical stuff to try to make people think these things aren't allowed. And a lot of people have a lot of misinformation. You know, there's a lot of misinformation being spread around out there. Like even about the marriage amendment, there were actually offices we walked into, well, one office, where they really thought that in Massachusetts where gay marriage is legal, that the Catholic churches had to perform them. It was like, hello, do you, don't you understand the First Amendment? Religious groups decide who they will and won't marry. Civil law is very different. You know, that's who gets uh, Social Security retirement. Well, DOMA doesn't allow that either, but, you know, who, who gets legal status? Yeah. 